So we begin Proverbs 17 and 18. Let's open up with a prayer. Lord, we continue reading from the book of Proverbs, uh, a continuing theme, the advice for a righteous life. Uh, help us again to take each verse in, to um, take them to heart, to do the best we can to understand the point that you're making, and the wisdom that is found in, in each and every statement brought to us in these chapters. Be with us and bless us as you have in the past and will continue to do in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. I took a few notes, you know, maybe to break up our reading a little bit that uh, just, I, I think I took them out of the People's Bible, that there's different sections that come up that uh, have little headlines that maybe break it up just a little bit. And, and sometimes there's a few verses and sometimes there's only one or two verses. Uh, but we both kind of, we're continuing with that same overall theme of, of advice for uh, living a righteous life that we're going to find in Proverbs. And again, uh, just a, a, a enjoyable thing to read through each of these verses and kind of spend a little bit of time trying to uh, understand exactly what's being said in each one. So um, it's, it's a, it's a well worth, uh, well worth the time we spend on it. So I'm going to begin in Proverbs uh, 17. This is actually a continuation over from chapter 16, where we had uh, under the heading of general advice and observations through the, up through the first six verses of Proverbs 17. So let me uh, jump to our Bible reading there. If you see the sheet that we have, and here, if you're following yeah. wrong in your Bible, you can do so. You close. If not, um, you can uh, just follow along as I read them. So again, general advice and observations. Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. I like how they started us off there. Verse 2, a wise servant will rule over a disgraceful son and will share the inheritance as one of the brothers. And we think of some of those servants, Eliezer, you could, you could actually have in, in Bible times where uh, if you did not have children, we think of Abraham uh, questioning whether Eliezer was going to be the son of the promise. You could elevate a servant to that position. I also read that you could almost disinherit um, one of your sons and have a servant take their place if, if, that was, um, if that was the case of a disgraceful son. So that was interesting. Verse 3, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord test the heart. A wicked man listens to evil lips. A liar pays attention to a malicious tongue. He who mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. Children's children are a crown to the aged, uh, grandchildren, and parents are the pride of their children. And then, then we kind of have a little shift after those verses where we get to uh, what we would call um, consequences of being a fool. And this is just verses 7 through 10 that comes into play. My phone is ringing and I don't want it to ring with an unknown number. So if one of you are calling me, I just hung up on you. Uh, verse 7, arrogant lips are unsuited to a fool. How much worse lying lips to a ruler. Verse 8 is a little bit hard to understand, has a couple of interpretations. It says a bribe is a charm to the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he succeeds. And some people say, well, that doesn't seem to fit because is Solomon commending those who take bribes and saying that they will find success? There's a number of interpretations. One is uh, that you would have to almost understand the, what, what isn't written, that it appears as if he succeeds, but in the long run, he won't. There was another that says the word for bribe in Hebrew, actually one of its lesser meanings could be gift. And then you would read it with a whole different meaning. A gift is a charm to the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he succeeds. Uh, and, but probably the one that I found was to be the most popular is sometimes Solomon just states the way things are. He does this when he talks about bribes. It seems to be, he's, say, he's not saying this is a good thing. So we, we shouldn't jump uh, to conclusions and assume that he is commending someone that uses a bribe. But actually just saying, this is how the world is. A bribe is a charm to the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he succeeds. 
uh, or so it seems in in the eyes of the world. So I, I didn't mind the one. I, I don't know if it's too much of a reach to believe that the word for bribe is also the word uh, could be translated gift, but uh, it seems more of the ones that I read were leaning towards this this last one that I mentioned that is probably just a statement of what the world sees and how the world conducts itself. So that's verse eight. Uh, a couple more verses under this heading, verse nine. He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Again, doesn't mean lying about what someone does, but not to, ex not to uh, put it out there in public when it doesn't have to be. And verse 10, wrapping up this part about the consequences of being a fool, a rebuke impresses a man of discernment more than a hundred lashes of fool. Um, 10 is easy to say, but I don't know if we always agree with it, that we like to be rebuked. But it says, if you're a man of discernment, you'll be impressed uh, by this idea of sometimes needing to be rebuked. So that's that section and the consequences of being a fool and going on beginning with verse 11. Um, this is closely related, the consequences of evil living. Verse, and it goes through 11 to 15. An evil man is bent only on rebellion. A merciless official will be sent against him. Better to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool in his folly. It's very picturesque. 13, if a man pays back evil for good, evil will never leave his house. Statement made, if you pay back evil for evil, that's not to be commended. But what if you pay back evil for good? It's even worse. You're always going to have evil in your house. 14, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. And then verse 15, acquitting the guilty and condemning the innocent, the Lord detests them both. The Lord wants justice. That wraps up the section on the consequences of evil living. And it kind of shifts back from verses 16 to 24, the mind of a fool. So you'll see that theme, the mind of a fool, beginning with verse 16. Of what use is money in the hand of a fool since he has no desire to get wisdom? Well, doesn't uh, pursue ways to use it wisely. Verse 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. A man lacking in judgment strikes hands in pledge and puts up security for his neighbor. That one comes across almost as a bit saying we should never help people, but that's not what it's saying. It's just the caution is there that um, be careful about too, too quickly striking up deals, signing, co-signing, things like that, uh, because we often hear of situations that don't turn out so well. So that's what the caution is there. Verse 19, he who loves a quarrel loves sin. He who builds a high gate invites destruction. Uh, that high gate, I think that's brought up in the look section, so I'll save it for that. Verse 20, a man of perverse heart does not prosper. He whose tongue is deceitful falls into trouble. Verse 21, to have a fool for a son brings grief. There is no joy for the father of a fool. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. I think that's the verse that we use at the bottom of our worksheet. Wraps up this section. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. 23, a wicked man accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the course of justice. A discerning man keeps wisdom in view, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. And that wraps up that section on the mind of a fool. Then you have just one verse that is kind of thrown in on a foolish son being more specific. And it kind of supports the uh, verse that we had uh, up in verse 21, to have a fool for a son. Verse 25, a foolish son brings grief to his father, but it also now includes the mother and bitterness to the one who bore him. So that kind of expands on verse 21. Then a couple of verses under the theme of self-control, verse 26, it is not good to punish an innocent man or to flog officials for their integrity. A man of knowledge uses words with restraint and a man of understanding is even tempered. And then you have one that goes back about fools in general in verse 28, 
even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. We're going to look at that one and see what that means. But that's chapter 17 of the book of Proverbs. Any comments or questions or anything that struck you as we read through chapter 17? And if you've got something flagged and we don't cover it in our discussion questions, feel free to bring it up anytime or at the end. So uh, we'll bring the sheets up and we'll go through them. And if you have them in front of you, that's great. Otherwise, follow on screen. Verse 3 talked about the crucible for silver. Just so you know, a crucible, heavy metal container in which gold or silver was melted to remove impurities. So the Lord wants to remove the impurities of sin from our lives. His trials are the crucibles of our lives. He may use troubles or sufferings to purify us. One of those uh, references in scripture that even if we're suffering, God is going to use it for our good. That's a way of purifying us, of strengthening our faith, of teaching us not to always rely on ourselves or to think that we always have the answers, but to turn to him. And verse 19 was one I read about, and this kind of supports it. I, I guess I can see this. If you remember verse 19, um, just going back to what it says, it says, he who builds a high gate invites destruction. And I, I thought when I first read it, it was kind of this case of if you put a high gate up, you're just, you're just challenging someone to come after you. But there's a different take, and I read this in a couple places. This is a keeping up with the Joneses type statement. If one's neighbor has a big impressive gate in front of his or her house, the temptation is to build a higher one. And Solomon says that such competition invites destruction. I guess I'm okay with that. I wondered a little bit about you know, I only I found it found that same interpretation in just two places. So I kind of thought too, maybe that if you build a high gate, is there anything wrong in that? Unless you were trying to keep up with the Joneses type thing. Otherwise, um, is it just challenging someone, which wouldn't be anything wrong with building a high gate for defense reasons? So maybe that second uh, explanation makes some sense. Anyone have questions on the look section or any of the verse to, to need, that needs further explanation? All right, let's let you guys talk a little bit and go in the discussion section. Have you ever been secretly happy when you heard bad news about someone? And just for reference sake, it's verse five that says, he who mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will go unpunished. I will answer that first one for all of us because I think without anyone having to air their dirty laundry, yeah. Uh, and if you don't, blessings to you that you don't have that kind of a personality. I think I think the sinful nature maybe at some time or, or another in our lives, there's something about, and, and I have known some people that um, when they would hear bad news about someone, gen, genuinely would be hurt or concerned or sympathetic. I think uh, right away, and it was one of his great, great attributes remains uh, to this day, uh, our very first vicar, Matt Simpleman, was a guy who, if you were going to write up, I think I had it in his report too, just a genuine guy who sincerely took interest in people. And if you told him something was, and it's to this day when I talk to him, if, if I'm talking and and we talk about ministry and, and, you know, he just has that, his heart goes out to people and it's not fake and, and it's just genuine. He's always had that. And I've seen that in him over the years and always appreciated that such a a strong uh, characteristic to have, but, and, and some of you do too. I don't want to isolate you and say none of you do, but what, maybe for the rest of us, what, what might make a person feel that way? When you hear bad news about someone that in, in deep inside, there's some, some undesirable joy that we have even as Christians, who wants to speak to that? I mean, Claire. Yeah, Lisa. I, th I think that, you know, especially if it's someone that has wronged you or that is just not one of your favorite people or whatever, you know, a lot of times it's easier to think, well, yeah, they're getting what they deserve or whatever. And it's just kind of a, a it, it's just kind of part of our sinful nature that, you know, leads us to think that you might go back and think 
oh, well, that wasn't very nice of me, but you know, yeah. it's kind of one of those gut reactions a lot of times. Yeah, I think you're, yeah, I think that's good. That sometimes we think, well, they had it coming. And so a little bit of us said, see, there's what we call karma in the uh, unbelieving world. Um, Jed. I don't think, uh, you know, necessarily you, you want harm to come to your, your neighbor, but I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of times in competition, whether it's at work or even just in sport, you know, I mean, I have to say it doesn't hurt me to watch, you know, Matthew Stafford get injured or watch somebody at work, you know, maybe uh, not succeed when in reality I should be more focused upon what I'm doing and maybe what the Green Bay Packers are doing as compared to what your competitor or your fellow man's doing. Yeah, that I, I think that goes along the lines, you know, you use the sports reference. I think then you know it's going to in some way benefit, in, in, a, in a probably in, in behind it all, that's going to benefit your team when someone else gets hurt. So it's this idea your team's going to look better and you bring that into our lives. If someone else is suffering, somehow that we're going to look better. And secretly we think almost like, well, they had it coming, so now we're going to look better. I think that's, you know, it really does translate over to how we see it in sports too. What's another, another reason or anything, anyone else sees something as to why we take some kind of secret happiness at, at, the, at the fate of others when they're suffering? Maybe really closely related, is it jealousy? That we're jealous of what they have and now we see that, well, okay, they also have to suffer because we suffer and it brings them down to our level. I ran across something and maybe this is obvious to you, it wasn't so much to me, but um, it, it kind of made me mark it. It said that what we're actually doing when we gloat over the misfortunes of others is showing contempt for our creator who knows these people and is dealing with them for their good in his own way. And so if we rejoice in their suffering, we're not understanding that how God is working with them. We're actually showing contempt for the creator and uh, not understanding that he's going to use that for their good. And that's just a, a different way of thinking of it. And I thought there's a lot of truth to that. You know, maybe, maybe someone is going through something because God wants to strengthen their faith or bring them back to him. And for us to gloat over the misfortunes, and we should probably, again, be as, a, as supportive as we can. And uh, you know, like I learned from Pastor Zimpleman, that, that genuine concern and caring. I, I don't, you can't fake it. Don't fake it. I'm not telling you to, but there has to be kind of a change in our hearts a little bit that we ask uh, God to work on us to make us more, instead of this competition that will look better or that we're jealous, no, maybe out of concern for what someone is going through. So. I thought there was a good deal in that verse and appreciate your comments on that. Anyone else on that one? Let's go to question two. Note the wonderful way parents and children benefit one another. What does Solomon mean by crown and pride in verse six? Children's children are crowned to the aged. The parents are the pride of their children. What does uh, Solomon mean by crown and pride. What are grand? How can grandchildren be a crown to their grandparents? Deb, you're muted. Deb, you're muted. You're well, still muted, Deb. <laughs> I mean, they they're an offspring. They're a, a blessing for you know. 25, 30 years of hopefully raising your your own children in the way that God wants you to raise them. Yeah, and, and you get to witness that. You get to view your children in the role that you once were in with them, now hopefully reflecting what you taught them. Plus, you can spoil your grandchildren rotten and don't have to feel bad about it. So. How about go to the other side? How what does Solomon mean when you're, you're there, that pride? Um, children can be proud of their parents. Uh, Mark and Paula. Well, I think it's just like the other verses where they're talking about foolish sons and good sons or whatever. <clears throat> it's a two-way street. You can be proud of your children, <clears throat> or they can be a distraction or whatever. But same goes for the way children view the 
parents, at least I do, you know, uh, I'm sort of surprised. You see what they've done, what they've accomplished with yeah. their hardships and and good times and bad times and, and the influence they've had on your life and other people's lives and what other people say about them. It's just, you know, I'm proud of my parents. I'm sure most people are. And so, you know, the idea with when you look at your parents and, and if you, if you, you know, telling, not, not necessarily always telling them you're proud of them, but just in, when you see your children kind of modeling the same kind of behavior, uh, making some of the same choices and um, knowing especially that you've brought them up to know their savior and they're following in their footsteps as far as their faithfulness to the savior. Yeah, that, that's, um, you can see children in a way expressing the pride that they have in their parents. Uh, that they model them. We, we don't always see it. We, that's why we appreciate it so much when our children do give us compliments or say something. Uh, but uh, a lot of times, just when you see them, maybe not wanting to admit it, but they're acting just like you were when, when you were raising them, and now they're, they're growing into adulthood and seeing that that can be a source of, of them showing that they're proud of you. And kind of a neat thing, just watch for it. Anyone else on that? Three, what are people tempted to do when they hear gossip? Let's answer that part first. What are people tempted to do when they hear gossip? Jump in. So what was that, Mark? Jump in. Jump in. Yeah, Jed? I was just going to say spread it. Yeah, <laughs> Tell everybody uh, else. <laughs> man, that's the thing. And, and uh, how many times do we completely shut it down as we should that we're just tempted to, Hey, here's what I heard from so-and-so and how many, you know, you've, you've probably done that exercise of telling a story through a number of people. And then the last person tells the story and how far it is from the original gossip works the same way. Gossip has evil intent. And as it's told over and over, it's just going to be exaggerated and, and spun out of control and often is much worse than, than it originally was. Uh, the question, the follow-up there is, what happens because of this? And they have us referring to verse 9. He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter, do you see that last part? What happens? Separates close friends. Um, destroys friendships. And I, I don't think we always always realize that or always take that to heart. And this is according to this verse, what should you do instead? Verse 9. What's the alternative? Do you have it in front of you? Just keep quiet about this matter. Yeah, keep cover it. Yeah, you know, we, we talk about in verse 9 that keeping quiet. He who covers an offense. I like how you put that uh, keep quiet about. That's really what it's saying. It's not saying to approve of it or to encourage it. But, you know, we don't, we don't always, when you go to a person, if it is something that's involving sin, remember Matthew 18, the first step is go by yourself and keep it quiet. You don't have to say, hey, did you hear what so-and-so did? Or do you hear what's, you know, what someone does? We're going to talk about, uh, I think a little bit down here before too, but um, it comes up again, I believe in chapter 18, but this idea that what if the old eighth commandment to take your words and actions in the kindest possible way, the old way was put the best construction and everything. Anna, I saw your hand up. I was just going to say, I kind of keep more in on the part where it says foster love, um, where to me, that's more encouraging you to rather than spread whatever they're saying, be the person who encourages them to love whoever they're talking about. Like, well, maybe they're going through a tough time. Maybe this is going on in their life or um, things like that. And that's, and that helps ease maybe that gossip by reminding them like what they should be doing. Yeah, that's a good point, Hannah. I, I bring it up with a confirmation class when we talk about sins of omission to, as an illustration. I say, for example, if you heard someone that wasn't there, but someone was making fun of someone, how many times have you been the person that steps in and defends that person and says, hey, come on, that, that's not right? Because our first reaction is, well, if we didn't join in, then we were doing the right thing. Reality is, if we don't stand up for a person, 
um, then then uh, then then we're not following through on this passage. And then I talk about how I ask people, how many times do you remember? I ask the kids, and it applies to us as adults. How many times do you remember stopping a gossip or stopping a rumor and and standing up and putting a halt to it? You know, we we just walk away for the most part, I think, or maybe we just smile. Uh, but I don't know how often we're bold enough to just to just squelch something. Uh, Lisa, your hand. Yeah, well, I had it come up last yeah. week, and, and normally it is one of those things where you just, you know, you hear it and you just walk, you know, once you walk away and don't carry it on. But, you know, it was one of those deals where I, I said, well, I never had a problem with that person. And, you know, it's kind of a group that was there. And it was, it was so interesting how the whole thing flipped from, you know, one person telling this story to all of a sudden, everybody kind of looking at the person like, you know, well, maybe they're the problem. I mean, they didn't say it, but it was, it was just the whole thing just clicked, man. It just, it was just amazing. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's, there's so many different ways we can handle it that are so much better than being so insecure about ourselves that we join in with that, that mob mentality and, and just kind of jump on board with everyone else. Jed, your hands up. Well, I just think right now we're put in a, you know, I know myself personally, I'm put in a tough position because you find out things, you know, I mean, in my job where I have to go and say, hey, how are things? How are you doing? And then sometimes you become this venting post. And so it puts you in a tough position because um, you feel like you want to help, you know, whether it's helping them find another job or helping them, you know, find deal on something but at the same time it's like a fine line to walk where you're trying to understand their concerns but and help them but you don't want to let everybody know their business either you know <laughs> yeah, i think jed falls under that category of we, we are to speak the truth but to speak the truth in love and you know sometimes in our positions that we're in as far as our jobs are concerned when when we have to evaluate that's always a tough thing to evaluate but hopefully to do it constructively um, and sometimes it's a case where someone may not be cut out for a job and we have to just be honest about that but there, there's different ways you can handle that without um, tearing someone down um, I, I just I think the whole idea of gossip usually isn't in a, an official capacity gossip is you know like we like to call it making conversation when it really isn't gossip is simply let's pile on someone that were that insecure so Make some good sense there on number three. I'm going to move on unless we have someone else on that. Four says, what often happens to little quarrels? Take that part of the question first. What happens to little quarrels? Just, we just had a little disagreement. Why don't we hear too many of those things? What happens to them? Well, it can blow into something bigger mm -hmm. if the, the little minor things aren't taken care of. Yeah, they grow up. Little corals grow up and they can escalate. And if we have that, it says, is it always best, is it always best to drop the matter and leave it unresolved? Look at verse 14. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam, so drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Who wants to speak to that part? Is it always best to drop the matter and leave it unresolved? Then we're going to go to verse 27, but let's just kind of talk about that first. Well, really, the EHV says it's like opening a floodgate, so yeah. stop the dispute before it gets started. So instead of Which dropping be, dropping the instead matter, instead of dropping it, stopping it. So okay. basically, I what I see with that translation is they're saying take care of this little dispute, you know, before mm -hmm. it gets big. I think, and if you if you if you team it up with verse twenty seven, a man of knowledge uses words with restraint. A man of understanding is even tempered it maybe leans a little bit towards that EHV translation that you're not just going to dismiss it and say, oh, we're not going to talk about this and drop it. 
but you're going to to stop it to a point where maybe EHV, do you think, Lisa, is that kind of saying, we're not so much saying leave it unresolved, but, but take care of it. Don't let it yeah. expand. Yeah. Yeah. With, with the stop, it's like, okay, let's stop this right here and mm -hmm. take care of it rather than, okay, we're just dropping this. We don't want to talk about it, you know? So, you know, and it's totally different because if you drop it, then it's just going to fester. Whereas if you stop and take care of it, then hopefully it's going to be resolved and not get into, you know, something that's going to break the dam and cause yeah. a flood. I have, you know, there's the passage that we use, don't let the sun go, go down while you're angry with one another. And, and that's often quoted about, you, know, you just don't want to go to bed mad and you want to get things resolved. Uh, I've also though told couples, and I know there's one couple I worked with quite a while ago that, um, he said he was always tired at work because he was up till three or four in the morning trying to abide by that passage. And he said he and his wife would go round and round. And he says, I didn't want to go to bed mad, so I, but I, we just couldn't get it resolved. And I said, I said, well, maybe not to alter the passage too much, but sometimes you just got to call a timeout and say, let's talk about this tomorrow. And, and so you're setting your anger aside, but it's amazing sometimes with a decent night's sleep when you wake up it isn't as big of an issue and if you and it's i sometimes put the the responsibility more on the men in a relationship as leaders to say you know we're not getting anywhere here and we're starting to say things that are anything but constructive so let's just not talk about it anymore uh and and let's and and i will talk with you tomorrow about it and i've had and i had with that person too that they said they, they kind of found out too. Talking about it like after work the next day usually didn't have the same kind of fire and brimstone that it had the day before. That things just calmed down because once, because I thought, well, if you're staying up till two, three in the morning just having this debate, you're just fraz you're just frazzled and you're frying out and you're probably not thinking. So it's it's a little offshoot of don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. It's more or less, you know, call a call a ceasefire for a while and and then. Make sure you resolve it when you can. I think there's something to this, too. It says, how can you keep a small matter from becoming a major dispute? I think that's where we look at verse 27. and gives us some, some tools to use. A uh, man of knowledge uses words with restraint. A uh, man of understanding is even-tempered. Um, there, I guess, we're, uh, there you it kind of just the follow-through that use an even-tempered approach stay calm um that's what restraint is just know when to hold your tongue there's a couple other passages talk about the tongue quite a few in proverbs matter of fact just just know that what you say sometimes does a lot more damage than anything you could do physically one, one thing i also look at is I, I believe in the right for reasonable people to disagree like even at church council meetings and in the past i'm not saying it's happened any time in the past year or you know, maybe further back than that, but, you know, there is a right for reasonable people to have different opinions on certain matters, and neither one is necessarily wrong, yeah. and neither one is necessarily right. It's two different ways of looking at the same situation and what the corrective action would be to, to take on that. There are a couple of verses in to, Proverbs 18 that does talk about uh, when, when one person thinks his opinion is always right <laughs> and which goes it's good to remember these yeah. verses when we get to that because that doesn't doesn't benefit yeah anything. i mean you know you look at the person that you're disagreeing with and you say well you know 75 percent of the time i believe this but this person is doing is right so this might be one of those times where it, them and i just are not going to agree on a situation mm -hmm. and yeah let it go Use restraint. I think that even temperedness means don't get yourself all, you know, uh, all fired up to prove your point and win the argument. Just, just stay calm. Listen to both sides. Agree to disagree if if it's an option. So, yeah, that's all in there. Moving on. I can't get my. There we go. Number five. The Lord wants justice to be served. Compare the way this concern is expressed in verses 15, 23, and 26. Just to do that first, 15 is acquitting the guilty and condemning the innocent. The Lord detests them both. 
23, a wicked man accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the course, uh, the course of justice. And then verse 26, it is not good to punish an innocent man or, flog, or to flog officials for their integrity. It says, why might an official be flogged, as it says in verse 26, for doing a just and honorable thing? And it refers us to back to verse 23, a wicked man accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the course of justice. See a, a, a reason why someone who is um, a just and uh, doing a just and honorable thing might still end up being punished or flogged? If their motive is wrong. I mean, uh, you know, you get politicians supporting certain projects and then they come to find out, well, down the road, well, they actually kind of had a, 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 a more of a, a different motive for, you mm -hmm. know, owned something somewhere else down the line that that helps them in their future. And, you know, they could easily support the plan, but maybe they're to benefit way at the end. And then it's, Kind of a bad thing necessarily not net i mean not necessarily bad but yeah it can be bad yeah let's see that especially point. if they're using it's like the government has some of its tools like this uh eminent domain thing where they can you know take somebody's property for certain projects if they absolutely feel it's for the benefit of the government or for the society and you know they might use that to get property that in ultimately in the end benefits them somehow. Okay. Lisa, Jim, I saw your hand pop up. Yeah, I would say in a situation where uh, you have a judge um, that is upholding the law of the land and, you know, it might be, might be you, it might be a family member that's, that's getting punished. And so, you know, the judge might, you know, you might be mad at him, even though he's doing what he should be doing. Yeah, okay. You talk, I think the whole thing, if you look at why, why sometimes if a, man, if a man of integrity ends up getting flogged or, or in some way is being persecuted, and then it refers us back to that verse 23, kind of saying, you know, there, there might be bribes going around. So you might have people that are innocent even those that in, in charge that are suffering as a result, just because we live in a sinful world where not everything is conducted the way it should be, that justice isn't always done. So yeah, just, uh, and it says, that's not a good thing when a man of integrity has to suffer in that way. So kind of le leading us into that thinking. Uh, verse, this, I like this last one. If I, if I picked out one verse I thought says a lot, it's probably the uh, verse 28. It says, why is keeping silent advised in verse 28? Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. And uh, then there's a James 1.19 passage. I'll look up in my Bible while we're answering the first part. Why is keeping silent advised in verse 28? I should get off the screen here so I can see your hands if you got it. Jim and Lisa? Well, I think, you know, sometimes people just talk and the more they talk, the less you think of them, you know, it, it's just, they, they just kind of, you just end up thinking this, put, this person's an idiot. And so sometimes it's better to keep your mouth shut so people don't know how big of an idiot you are. You, you know, think that, it. That's you actually, that's, that's one of the explanations I read that made me laugh a little bit. Uh, then people won't know how dumb you are or how much of a fool you are if you just keep your mouth shut. I think, I, I think that is one of the reasons. And there's some other reasons why that might be commendable towards you as a person other than saying, you know, you're, you probably will show everyone how much of a fool you are if you're going to run your mouth all the time. Hannah, I saw your hand up. Well, the the less you talk, the more you are listening to what is really on that person's mind and heart, and the more you're able to understand them. Um, I took a communications class in college, and it was for the purpose of ministry. And we always talked about you listen to understand. 
that's your first aspect of when you're talking with someone you're listening for what they're thinking you repeat it back to them and see if there's anything that they'd adjust so that when you're truly listening then you actually have all the knowledge you need to be able to respond accurately and appropriately is that the the line if we, after you listen to them you repeat it by saying now if i heard you correctly and then you just repeat it so they can tell you if you're understanding it correctly that's exactly what james is saying in the reference there he said my dear brothers take note of this everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry and i've, I've shared with you i used to spend a lot of time pre-counseling when i knew people were coming to me i usually wanted to know why i wanted to know the details and then i set out with my plan of attack and uh, um, foolishly, I often thought I had their problem solved before they even came and talked to me because men are fixers, pastors are even more so fixers. So, And um, I finally learned that, no, there isn't prep work, really. Someone says they want to come talk to you. Your only question is, what's a good time for you? You don't need to know the circumstances. And then just listen. Anyone else have examples of that when keeping silent might be uh, advisable and how that gains kind of the trust of people? Deborah, you got something? I just wish I'd keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Are you like falling on your and own listen <laughs> and listen to understand because I know you'd never want to start a war or do anything like that or say anything like that. Start a war. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we at 18 chapter 18 is going to talk about some of this. It really is a good segue into it. Um, the, the final verse again, that sums up this section at the bottom, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So all of this advice for living a righteous life is so that we can have a cheerful heart. So uh, we're going to get into that with verse 18, which really carries on uh, some more about fools for the first couple of verses. So again, a, a chapter that, that comes or a division that maybe isn't the best division because it's got the same kind of thought. But let's go into uh, Proverbs 18 and continue our reading here and study here a little bit. So 18, the first two verses, some more stuff about fools. An unfriendly man pursues selfish ends. He defies all sound judgment. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in airing his own opinions. Does that kind of match up with verse 28 of our last chapter? Delights in airing his own opinions. Uh, likes to hear himself talk is really what it says. And then the next three verses, verses 3 to 5, talks about some aspects of wickedness. When wickedness comes in verse 3, so does contempt, and with shame comes disgrace. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters, but the fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. One can drown you, the other refreshes you, is how I saw it. Verse 5, it is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the innocent of justice. And then verses 6 through 8, it talks about more of a fool's mouth. A fool's lips bring him strife and his mouth invites a beating. <laughs> That's a pretty straightforward uh, statement. Verse 7, a fool's mouth is his undoing, and his lips are a snare to his soul. 8, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost I parts. I think we talk about that one, unless I just was reading about it. No, we do talk about that. We'll save it for our worksheet. But there's a lot in that little verse 8. One on laziness, just shoved in here in verse 9. One who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. And then a couple of verses that in, in 9 and 10, or in 10 and 11, that talk about two types of safety. Now in verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it an unscalable wall. Verses 12 through 16 have the theme of human attitudes. 
Verse 12, before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. Goes back to verse 28 of our last chapter. Verse 14, a man's spirit sustains him in sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear? Verse 15, the heart of the discerning acquires knowledge. The ears of the wise seek it out. 16, a gift opens the way for the giver and ushers him into the presence of the great. And that one comes up, uh, well, maybe it doesn't. I don't see it on there. Some have wondered about that verse too, that that same word, maybe the translated gift. I don't know if it's the one that was translated bribe before, but same arguments made. Is this is this commendable that you can buy your way in, or is it just saying it's a good thing to give gifts? You know, that, that uh, it's, it's um, a nice way to um, show people that you care about them. Others say maybe it says a bribe opens the way for the giver and ushers him into the presence of the great. So that's another one of those verses that might have. Maybe it could be considered like a church donation. I mean, I'm just, I'm just huh. that are, you, are you thinking a the great? A gift to the church, a donation to the church, to the opens Lord. The who, who's the great then, Phil? Ushers him into the presence of the great. Would that be God? Uh, not necessarily. Not quite that far, but uh, pastor, uh, or, or maybe in a law, in a roundabout way. Uh, you know, it, it gets you know, giving to the church. What does the EHV say for that, Lisa? Church. Lisa, you have the EHV, and that's verse. What was that verse again? Yeah. Sorry. Person, person's gift verse. opens doors for him. Opens doors for him? What does the first part say? It says a gift, though, too? Yes. Oh, okay. Maybe, and then it's, so, I don't know. I, I didn't necessarily think it was a, a necessarily a negative it's, thing. There was just some, some things I read said that, you know, is that still a, one of the verses that could maybe be bribe instead? Here it's, tra it's translated as gift. Okay, so there's a, a little footnote for opens doors, it says, or makes room. Or makes room, okay. More would make room for him, yeah. Okay. And it says it leads him into the presence of great people. Okay. So I guess that's the rest of us at church, right? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the great you, people, you right? Also, you could also be thinking, you know, that it's just, Maybe you're trying to spread the gospel, and it, it opens it opens doors. It, it gets you that connection, so you can tell them. Hey, that, that, that's like you just reminded me of something. You know what we do, and Mark knows this on evangelism. Um, we give gifts uh, when we leave things with people that have come to visit us. We like to take not only information on our church, but you might get a free video, you might get a free pen, you might get something. We always have little gifts that we want them to remember. You know. Um, you know, who we are. That's one of the purposes. I'm sure they would, would understand that, but also just to say thank you for coming. Uh, one church, we talked about this once, they gave $5 Starbucks cards to everyone that visited and a whole bunch of them gave a gift card and just said, hey, we're just glad to have you. So it, I think it shows appreciation. And that's why I think you could take that verse in a positive sense and not necessarily try to see if it, he's stating something negatively. So thanks for your input on that. That helps out a lot. Um, where are we? I'm totally lost now. Oh, there it is. Uh, verse 12 or verse 17. And this is, uh, the next three verses talk about contentions or, or arguments. Verse 17, the first to present his case seems right till another comes forward and questions him. Is that the old two sides to every story passage? Got to hear both sides. Uh, verse 18, casting the lot settles disputes and keeps strong opponents apart. Is there times to flip a coin? Probably. 19, an offended brother is more unyielding than a fortified city and disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. Boy, if you rub someone the wrong way. A couple verses 20 and 21 about talking again. From the fruit of his mouth, a man's stomach is filled with the harvest from his lips he is satisfied. 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. That might be the most straightforward uh, passage about the, what the tongue can do. And those who love it will eat its fruit, good or bad. Uh, verse 22, 
He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. And then sandwich in between this verse and verse 24, a poor man pleads for mercy, but a rich man answers harshly. And then the nice uh, verse to end on, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's a neat chapter to have for tonight. So let's look on your sheets, unless I see any comments. Uh, I don't see any. For Proverbs 18, verse 10, the name of the Lord is mentioned in verse 10. Uh, just a reminder. It's a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. God's personal name. And see there, we've talked about this before, kind of the last statement in that paragraph. When you have the um, covenant God, you have all capital letters, and we should always pay attention to that when we see it. The name of the Lord, God's personal name is Lord, distinguishing him from the idol gods of Israel's neighbors. This name reminded the Israelites of God's covenant promises. He would be their God and they would be his people. It always carried with it the idea of grace and mercy and the idea that God would fulfill his promises for his people. I've always said it means he's the God of the covenant. And that's why Solomon says that God's name is a strong tower the God of grace declares sinners to be righteous for Christ's sake. And this is what, is what makes them safe from sin's punishment. And again, you'll always see it in capital letters. So there's the reason for that being done that way. Let's look at our questions then. Have you ever been at a meeting where one person gives his or her opinion on every issue other than me leading a Bible study where it seems like I do a lot of the talking? And then it says, have you ever been that person? If you, if, uh, you're, if you, what is the old saying? If you can't think of anyone that you've ever been around that does that, you might be that person. <laughs> is that similar to what someone once said that maybe that's you if you've never, if you can't ever think of that situation? Um, and what are some dangers in doing this? If uh, gives his or her opinion. Sometimes you are the teacher and the leader of a class. So pastors get a little bit of a pass, even though my wife chides me repeatedly in the chat about talking too much. Am I calling you out, dear? Was I supposed to let everybody know you chide me throughout my classes? And I call you my wife instead of Deborah? Okay, from now on, Deborah tells me I talk too much. Sometimes you have to. But what do you think? Um, what are some dangers in doing this, always being the one who has to give his or her opinion? You're not listening if you're always talking. Okay. And then you can't understand other points of view. We probably, it, it's, it's, sometimes we have people at our conferences that you'll pause during the reading of a paper and they'll always have a comment. I mean, you can almost, and it, every once in a while, we'll kind of nudge each other to say, wow, what a shocker, look who's talking. And, and there's just some guys that like to talk. And there used to be, I think when I came into ministry, someone said, your first year, or maybe it was your first two years, you don't say much during conferences because you're the new person right out of the seminary. And not everyone wants to hear all of your uh, seminary training brought forth for all these seasoned men who don't know any better. So there's a little caution in that, but every once in a while there's someone that maybe doesn't understand that and they've always got their hand up that they're going to tell everyone what, what they know. So I think you hit on it. Luke, anyone else on that dangers in doing that? Nobody likes a know-it-all. Is that fair? I like this verse eight. Let's talk about this one a little bit. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost parts. And the question is, why are the words of a gossip labeled choice morsels? Let's see if we can unpack that a little bit. Well, they kind of satisfy the craving, the curiosity craving we have, similar to what like a, a piece of brownie does, you know, 
I want a brownie. Okay. <laughs> oh, just so you know, my wife did cook brownies this past week. That's not why, why it's so I got fresh brownies on the brain again. So e e H V says the words of a gossip are like delicious food. Doesn't say brownies so. though. People <laughs> oh. gobble them right down. So, you know that gobble them right down kind of. They're anxious, anxious to hear them, anxious to take them in because, and, and just, just think, and this is, I understand your, your old Adam reacting, but when someone says, wait till I tell you what I heard, what's your first reaction? Not to say, don't tell me, don't tell me, because if it's gossip, I don't want to hear. There's, there's a little mini adrenaline rush in each one of us for that choice morsel that will go down easily, will stick to our ribs, and it's going to sit there for a while because we want to take in what someone has to tell us. And far too often it's going to be gossip and not something that's going to be beneficial. And, and you're not, not easily forgotten. You get good food and you, it's going to sit there for a while. You won't be hungry. Well, that's the kind of thing we do with gossip too. So that choice morsels, I like that. They, something that sticks, even if it's like brownies, Something goes down real easy because you're really sinful nature yearns for it, I think is what we're saying. Anyone else on that verse, verse eight? Number three, a person once said a gossip always has three victims. Can you guess who they are and how is each one harmed? Three victims of gossip. Let's see if we can name them, then we'll talk about how they're harmed. Tell the one telling it. Oops, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, the one telling it, the one hearing it, and the one that's being talked about. Is that what you were going to say as well, Luke and Tori? Yep. Okay, how is the person, um, the gossipers, how are they harmed that are doing the gossiping? Well, they may just be wrong. They may not know all the circumstances, and they're just kind of spouting opinions and stuff they may not know all the facts about. If, if you're hearing someone gossip to you about someone else, remember this. They have probably gossiped to someone else about you. So if, you, if someone is always the person that loves to, to, to spread the latest news, they're hurting themselves because who can trust them? Why would you tell that person anything if they have that reputation? Hannah, was that your hand I saw? Yeah, I, I was same lines. I was just going to say that they're harming their own reputation because how people hear them talking about others, um, they won't want to talk to them anymore because they'll hear how either judgmental or whatever um, they're saying about other people. And they're probably going to be the last person you're going to share anything with if you truly understand the, what, what kind of nature they have or what kind of personality or what kind of attributes they have where they just tell everyone about things. Maybe that, let's take the one in the middle. What about the person being gossiped about? Maybe that's an easy one. How do they get harmed in gossip if they're being gossiped about? Well, the well, reputation, whether it's true or not. Yeah, what was that again, Mark? Their reputation, whether yeah. it's true or not. Yeah, and I like how you added the last part. It doesn't have to be whether it's false and then they're hurt. Even if it's true, you'd be hurting someone's reputation. So that we know of. But what about those who hear the gossip? How are they being harmed? that you're hearing the gossip. Maybe you don't always think about this. If you allow someone to share gossip with you, how are you being harmed? Well, uh, you're Jim, Jim, and Lisa. Jim and Lisa, your hand? Yeah, I think about it. It's the stuff where the field. You, know, you think, well, my, I sin, but I don't sin that bad. You know, theirs is worse than me. You know, that, that, that was the thing. You think that. So. Okay, you're going to think that, wow, I'm not that, you know, that, that bad. Again, our own self-esteem. Who else knows something about how those who hear the gossip are harmed? Well, you may have originally had a, a correct, good opinion of the individual. I like it, Phil. And hearing the, the bad, the false gossip or just 
to gossip in general may lower your opinion of that individual, which may affect you later on in your dealings with that person. I like that, Phil, because that may not be the first thing you think of, and that wasn't the first thing I thought of, but your, your opinion of someone is poisoned when you hear gossip about that person. You, you, like you said, you, you may have a, a, a wonderful opinion of someone, or maybe you're just neutral towards that person, but then you hear something. What does that put in your mind? You know, our minds love to just soak that in. And all of a sudden, it's shaped us as far as what we think about a person. And, and that's where, when you hear the gossip, you can't say, well, hey, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't join in. And it wasn't me talking about it. But if you give someone an audience, it's going to harm you in the long run. So nobody wins. Nobody wins. And yet, it's probably one of the more prevalent sins that we have as far as which ones do we fall into the most. I think everyone does it. It's so easy to gossip. So good warning for us. Anyone else there? I'm going to go on to number four. I was going to say it may lead you to be the gossiper the next time. And just oh, yeah. Continue. That's, yeah. And, and that's, it just kind of is a domino effect because we're going to, guess what I heard from so-and-so who heard it from so-and-so. And most likely the story won't be straight and shouldn't be told in the first place. You're right, Mark. Thanks. What warning does Solomon give the rich in verse 11? The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it an unscalable wall. What's the warning Solomon gives here? What's that mean, unscalable wall? Um, Money can't fix everything. Oh, yeah, Steve, what was that again, Steve? Money can't fix everything. Yeah, um, it's your unscalable wall. If I have money, I have everything. Jim and Lisa, on the same lines? or Yeah, it was kind of the same thing. I'm untouchable because I have so much money, and, you know, therefore uh, bad things aren't going to happen or whatever. Yeah, yeah, So, and that we think it's unscalable. I always think we're getting to, in Joshua's study, the – fall of Jericho, the unscalable walls. We've got everything we need. If we have money, nobody can touch us. And how, how foolish it is to think that way. Good. Anyone else on number four? Yeah. Um, Mark? It could lead you to walk away from work. It's your false sense of security when the Lord should be your security. Instead of leaning on him, you're thinking you can do everything. I, I've, I've, someone said, said this and I've used it, that there's a reason that uh, if, if some of us, if, if most of us have not won the lottery, there's a reason why some of us haven't because God knows it wouldn't be good for us because <laughs> uh, maybe we had all that money. Maybe we had, we had all that security. We could, our, our faith could be threatened. We could lose our faith. So God knows us better than we know ourselves. So thank him next time you're not blessed with a boatload of money. He's probably working out uh, for your good. Uh, verse 5, what rude behavior is exposed in verse 13 that says, he who answers before listening, that's his folly and his shame. Why do people do that, and what does that indicate about a person? Answers without listening, why is that rude behavior? Maybe let's go on and want the follow-up. Why do people do that in the first place? They know what they think, and they know they're right, and really don't need to listen to what you're telling them. So they are not in any way going to open themselves up to a possible different way of looking at something. That they theirs is the right way, and they're just going to put it out there. That's rude, right? What does that indicate about a person that's like that? Well, for one, they're pretty close-minded. Okay, yeah. yeah. So. How about the relationship of that person with other people? What does it say about how they think, think of other people? They would be smarter and, you know, and above other people. Okay, right. Hannah? I was going to say it's more so about their appearance, that they're trying to they look like they're trying to help somebody, but it's more about how like, oh, I'm really helping them. And it's more prideful than really taking the time to 
listen to the person. Yeah, more. I think there's those people that are just like fixers, and they they think that they're helping the person, but Mm -hmm. when they're just talking and not actually listening, they're actually showing that they don't care what the person has to say. Yeah, really, what you said. They're just disrespectful. It is disrespectful if you're not going to listen to people and you think you're always right, and that's going to wear thin with people after a while. So you're right. Running long on time here. Thanks for your patience. What helps a person deal with an illness or a handicap in verse 14? And it says, a man's spirit sustains him in sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. So what helps a person deal with an illness or a handicap? Positive attitude. Yeah, that's a man's spirit when it's talking about that. Um, um, just to be positive, optimistic. And it says, how can, how can you develop that spirit? All right, Luke, tell us how. <laughs> it's, it's right. I mean, that's what does it. But how do we get that? Practice. How so? Um, uh, Hannah, Hannah, jump in. You're right, Luke. But I think you just think about what could be worse. I mean, somebody who's less fortunate than you or has the worst case than you. And then you remembered how blessed you are. Where scripture says, it's not like you're the only person who's ever gone through this. Other people have been, you know, have suffered in the same way you have. And, and practice, you know, along that, Luke, I thought of if, if you know of God's goodness and you look at how he's been there with, for you in the past and, and you just have come to learn that God's always going to take care of you and his love and his goodness is kind of the key. And, um, I think, and then on the other side, we talk about a crushed spirit. That, does, that affects you mentally. It affects you physically. It affects your emotions if you just are crushed. So be positive. Be optimistic. Let's build people up with that. Um, if you're going to tell people to hang in there, tell them why. Because God is there with you. Don't just say, well, hang in there. Keep on trucking. That's from the 70s. Keep on trucking. Nobody says keep on trucking anymore. Deb, do you say that? Deb says no. Keep on trucking. That's the hang in there of my generation. But what is the advice of Solomon giving us in view of the observation in verse 17? He says, the first to present his case seems right till another comes forward and questions him. What advice is Solomon giving us in view of this observation? You mentioned before the two sides to every story. Yeah, it's... it's um, uh, it, it's very clear in counseling when I when I meet with one or the other individually, and uh, when they both tell me the story, it's it's really interesting that you do you got to hear both sides before you decide who's right. So, what two blessings does Solomon speak of in verses twenty two and then verse twenty four? What's verse twenty two talk about? Deb, How wonderful it is to have a wife. You know, I and I read, the, I and I'm. T- I'll get your opinion on this. In the People's Bible, it says it's probably understood, and I, it and just so you know, I'm not saying it. It says probably it's understood that it should say. Let me read it for you. Um, yeah, it just says a wife. It doesn't even say a good wife. Oh, or no, any- and this is you're you're getting to it, Deb. It says although he does not explicitly say it, the context makes it clear Solomon is speaking of a good wife here. He reminds us what a blessing she is, and then we get into the last chapter of Proverbs where he goes into detail on it. So, um, yeah, it's speaking of a good wife. And I, doesn't that change it a little bit? Um, doesn't say good wife. And but what is a good wife? I know, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking that, you know, if you find someone, you know, if, even if you say you find a good wife, if, if you find a spouse, that's a good thing. It's a good thing to be married. Is that a simple enough statement? Does it need that clarification that it's got to be a good wife? I don't know if I thought that had to be in there. He um, clarifies in the next verse, a poor man. Yeah. Why didn't he say good wife? Yeah. So I don't know if I agreed with the, the people's Bible, with Pastor Elke that threw that oh, out a little bit. Oh, I like the people's Bible. Yeah. Well, that's where it said that. And I said, oh, I don't know if you need to say, I think, you know, if you're fortunate to find someone who will marry you, that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, so if you, you hope it's a I good thing. I thought that 35 years ago. I got to mute my wife. Let me get you on the muter there. So she's quiet. Okay, good. What about verse 24? What's the other blessing along with a 
I'll unmute you, Deb, if you have more comments. What's the other thing we have in verse 24? We have a helper. Um, excuse me. Yes. Oh, you got a cat? Uh, verse 24 was, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Who wants to speak to that? The other blessing that we have, verse 24? Better to have a good, close friend than a whole bunch of acquaintances. Yeah, you know, you, you think of how close you are to someone who's your, who's your blood, who's your brother, your sister. But if you got a close friend that, you know, you, you consider family, what a blessing that is. And we all kind of have probably experienced that, to have someone that, say, man, they're just like family to me. They're like having a brother or sister. So that's what's brought up there. The name of the Lord is a strong tower from verse 10. The righteous run to it and are safe. That's the uh, wrap-up verse there. And we're 14 minutes beyond the hour. Not that we always say we have to only be an hour. You know, sometimes these would go an hour and a half when, when we were normally meet, but I try to keep it to an hour. Guess what the topic is uh, next week? Advice for living a righteous life. We'll do that again. Verses are chapter 19 and 20. We'll uh, continue from there. So anyone have any other comments or questions from our study tonight? See if our kids have made a supper or something to eat, Deb. Is that true? We did some running around with the kids today, so everything's out of whack, our schedule for Thomas, today. Thomas made supper last night. I know. Thomas is, he's a good cook. He's a good kid. So, oh, Pastor, have you got the service set up for Sunday yet or not yet? Service of word and sacrament. I will, I just, Thomas will be preaching on, on part of the epistle text from Romans. He is working on a sermon for that. And he said he'd let me pick out some hymns. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in no hurry. So if you got, I don't need them until Friday evening or so I'll, I want to I want to wrap up with a prayer, and then I do have a question for all of you, real quick, before you sign up. So let's pray, and I'm going to stop the recording. Then, Lord, thank you again for for teaching us how to be wise, so listening to your word, and and using common sense. So often, that's what what your wisdom is. It's just to think according to the new man and not follow the foolishness of our sinful nature. So we thank you for that again. Thank you for making us especially wise unto salvation through faith in your Son Jesus Christ. In His name, we pray. Amen.